Good afternoon and welcome to the September 24th, 2020 special meeting of the Marysville Board of Education. Can I have a roll call please? Mr. Luke? Here. Ms. Savage? Here. Ms. Powers? Here. Mr. Smith? Here. Ms. Devine? Here. So um, before, I know first on our agenda is reading of public participation comments and uh, before we read the letter, I just wanted to explain that um, I called this special meeting because after last week's meeting, it was brought to our attention that while the actual public participation form stated that letters needed to be submitted at least 24 hours prior to the scheduled regular meeting in order to be read, other parts of our website did not call out that 24 hour requirement. So since our website didn't align to the form, I thought it was important to hear these letters as soon as possible instead of waiting for our next regular meeting. Uh, we've updated our website so this requirement is consistently shown and I also want to be clear that public participation is usually not part of a special meeting, but is a part of our regular monthly meeting agenda. Uh, moving forward, we're planning to move our meetings to a location that will allow in-person attendance with social distancing, so stay tuned. And we're also going to start up our uh, monthly community coffees in October, and Nan will give us an update on that later. Additionally, uh, just a reminder, our emails are on the district website, Board of Education page, and we're always interested in hearing from our community. I do want to remind our parents and students that if you have concerns and questions, it's always best to start at the building level, at your child's teacher or building principal. I know they want to hear from you if you have questions or concerns. Um, if your question or your concern is more about a district-wide issue, then I recommend reaching out to our superintendent or assistant superintendent. Um, the reason being that the board's really not directly involved in daily operations, so when we do receive emails or talk to people with concerns, we always share that information with our superintendent so that those who can effectively address the issue or answer the question become part of the conversation. We do hear you, uh, we, and we want to continue hearing from you so that together we can keep working to improve and find creative solutions to best support our kids and families. So, with that, uh, Mr. Langhouse, I believe you have the honor of reading letters this afternoon. All right, we'll get started. <clears throat> uh, the first one is from Brett uh, Woodrin, 1762 Sassafras Court, Marysville, Ohio. I understand the reason for hybrid learning and the concern with COVID. However, I am more concerned about the students falling behind in their learning. I have a third grader that's will need to take the state proficiency test this year and I'm afraid my lack of ability to properly teach her could be detrimental. I enjoy having my kids home, but I think proper tutelage by the proper instructors is essential. Jenna Walter, 861 Royal Oak Drive. What is the plan to have students start back to school five days a week? What, is hap what has to happen for this to become a reality? I am asking for specific details of the plan. Adrian Woodring, 1762 Sassafras Court, Marysville, Ohio. Be bold, be brave, be monarch. Be a community that can figure out in-school learning five days a week. We are putting families in financial trouble, marriages struggling, increase in mental health, increase in anxiety, and an increase in screen time, all of which is proven to be unhealthy. We are robbing our youth of a proper and purposeful education. Lastly, the district is rob robbing our community of the freedom to choose in school learning. There are other communities <coughs> that have figured it out. Let's rise together and be monarchs I know we can be. Jason Burris, 2075 Preakness Place, Marysville, Ohio. My son is currently a hybrid student at Creekview. The teachers have done an amazing job. However, he is not getting the education he needs. Our kids need to go back to school five days a week. The COVID numbers do not justify the status quo. Thank you. Amanda Secuti, 1338 Cinnamon Drive. I think that students should get to go back to school five days a week so they can be more focused, get more undistracted education, and truly be structured. Julian Drushman, 
561 Quail Hollow Drive. We decided, we decided to start the year off participating in all virtual learning model. As much as our daughter is doing well, we know she could be doing better. Our dining room and her Chromebook are not a classroom. With every day that passes, I'm watching my daughter change. The excitement that was once there when it came to her education is, being, is beginning to fade. She is losing her spark. She is missing those connections with teachers and friends. She missing her independence. She is missing normalcy. The mental health of our children is really at stake here. Now is the time for the Monarch community to come together and work on a plan to get our children back into the building five days a week. Scott Beasley, 2027 Derby Drive, Marysville, Ohio. I'd like the board to strongly consider our children to return to school five days a week immediately. We can't play games with our children and their futures. They not only need time in schools learning in a consistent manner, but they also desperately need the social interactions of their friends and peers. I know I have seen my seven-year-old grow up too fast by being around no one but adults due to ridiculous mandates, regress some in subjects because of the inconsistent ways he is learning material and lose confidence in other aspects of his life. With the governor telling us to get used to this new normal until vaccines are made and a vast majority of the population takes it, this has no end in sight. We cannot do, do this to our children any longer. They don't deserve this. We are supposed to be giving them more opportunities than what we had growing up, yet we are taking everything away from them. Susan Musselman, 257 West 7th Street. The hybrid model has worked well for our family, and we hope it continues. Thank you for all that you do. Brittany Schoen, 1200 Bay Laurel Drive. Please let these children go back to school five days a week. There have been minimal cases reported since school started. There is really no reason we should still be on the hybrid model, especially when districts around us are going five days a week. Our kids are suffering. I have to work a full-time job from home while trying to teach and be mom at the same time. It is impossible. And I'm not convinced kids are even able to really learn this way. They need to be in the presence of their teachers who are qualified to teach them around their peers, socializing. They need to be in communication with their teacher more than two days a week and one 30 minute Zoom call. This is going to have detrimental effects on these kids for years to come. Stop ruining their lives and get them back into school full time. The hybrid model is not working. Let virtual be an option for families who wish to do so, and let families who want full-time in-person school do that. Come on, Marysville. We are begging you to do what is right for these children. Our active case rate in Union County is 4 one-hundredths percent. We have one hospitalization and only two deaths. Stop pretending like COVID numbers is what is keeping these kids out of school. No one is buying it. The city needs you. These kids need you. Do what is right, please. Trishel Weichel, 537 Ambrine Mill Road, Marysville, Ohio. I personally feel that my children should be obtaining school five days a week, as a child's education should be priority. Remote learning is not an acceptable for our children, as socialization and one-on-one -on -one learning is a major factor. My daughter has been in school for the last few weeks and loves being at school, but doesn't understand why she can't spend more time at school. I feel if it's safe to go two days, what is the difference of going full time? I feel it should be an option to send full time, and if you don't want to send your child, then utilize remote learning. Tori Harriot, 686 Meadow Drive. School five day week. Rachel Patari, 960 White Oak Court, Marysville. 
I'm ready for kids to return to school full time. My child has an IEP and he needs school full time. Callie Berry, 26000 Lunda Road, West Mansfield, Ohio. I want to go to I want school to go back five days a week. One of my children is on an IEP and she is not doing well at all. She needs the extra help from school. I'm not scared of the virus and neither are my kids. Rob Gower, 656 Arabian Circle. This school board has failed the parents who voted for them in the students of Marysville Exempted School District. Union County has very low numbers, 31 actively ill, and one hospitalizations. I would like to know why the school board has decided to have remote learning for this entire year. This is overreaction, and last spring, our children will be so far behind, it will be hard to overcome. Our children need to be in school five days a week. Renee Lauk, 224 Burger Street, Marysville, Ohio. Our children need to be in school five days a week. They are not only lacking in education, but also struggling with mental health and social skills. Some students need that extra help from a teacher that is able to reward a problem, question, or sentences that not all parents are able to provide. I know I'm not the only working parent, and this setup is beyond stressful for the parents and the children. This is putting a huge strange strain on mental health more than most want to recognize. I know personally I've sent four email messages to my child's teacher about links not working for the assigned schoolwork, issues with the dashboard they want to, to be used, etc., and still have no response. Mind you, I have two children in school, and that is just one child alone within a week. There is not time for a working parent to be productive at their job and wait on communication from schools and be their child's teacher. Our children need to be at school five days a week for their mental health, social skills, education, and so on. The list is long, and I'm only allowed 400 words. Tiffany Gross, 757 Arabian Circle. I realize there are more pressing issues currently, but has a decision been made about the 8th grade Washington, D.C. trip being rescheduled for May 18th through the 21st of 2021? Even if it looks as though the trip may be canceled in the future, approving the rescheduled date will allow parents enough time to request a partial refund in the future, especially parents who paid in full but did not purchase the trip insurance. Yes, that would be me. Right now, I believe at this point, we would not get any money returned due to the original October date being closed. Deposit date to 70 days prior to departure, 25% cancellation fee. 69 to 36 days prior to departure, 50% cancellation fee. 35 days up to departure, 100% cancellation fee. Thank you for your consideration. Melissa Wilferson. 978 Walker Woods Lane, Marysville. We would like to see our children go back to school five days per week. If the cases of COVID go up, then the schools have a great system set up, hybrid, to fall back on at a moment's notice. Adrian Rausch, 11000 Mary Road, Marysville, Ohio. I appreciate the online learning my child's teacher has provided but there is no replacement for in-person teaching. We are not doing anything good for anyone in our society by keeping kids home and limiting their education, no instruction, to two days a week. Kelly Curtis, 358 Hickory Drive. Though the hybrid model is well thought through and put together, it is very difficult when both parents work full time and the grandparents that thankfully we have as support, aren't computer savvy. My kids are not thriving and need to be back in class every day. I have a first and third grader that each learn in their own way, but it's not on the computer. One was behind before COVID, got further behind in the spring, and I feel it's falling even further behind now. 
Our kids are being affected horribly, both educationally and socially. Kara Immel, 536 Bridal Drive. I want to start with, I understand and respect this is unchartered territory. However, I respectfully request the board to make a statement regarding the requirements, measurable, fact-based, to move from hybrid to full-time school. What is the exit strategy? It is imperative that our children get back to full-time learning. Kirsten Rodriguez, 561 Glen Oaks Drive. Surrounding school districts have returned to five days a week. Why is Marysville not following? My children used to love school, but now say they hate it and they are giving up trying. They are not completing the work that needs done during the day while I'm working at Honda. By the time I come home, they are counted absent and it takes me two to three hours to get them to do their work. I have zero time to make dinner, so we have, we have been eating out a lot. All because this hybrid schedule is messing everything up. Kids need to go back to school full time or else they will fail, fall severely behind. My kids already have and they're missing school when it's not even their fault they are not logging in. I am supposed to am I supposed to quit my full-time job in order to do what is expected of them? This is not fair to them or working families. Get the kids back into school. Jeff Mullaney, 21857 Evans Road. The education the children receive in the hybrid model is absolutely ridiculous. My son is in fourth grade. The remote learning is due an iReady lesson, read 30 minutes, do a reflex math lesson, and watch a video on science or social studies. It takes them about one hour to complete. How is that even close to being the same education he would receive in seven hours at school? Our country has had less than three, our county has had less than 300 cases, seven months. The fact that children aren't in school is just completely insane. How long are we going to let our children's education suffer before we say enough panic is enough, quit living in fear of something that isn't even extreme in this country? Brian Fair, 684 Kentucky Circle, Marysville, Ohio. I am in favor of going back five days a week. If any parents are not comfortable with their children going five days a week, I would suggest that can have the option to continue homeschooling. Jamie Williams, 1446 Buckmeyer Drive. First, if this meeting is not safe to have in person, it cannot be safe for school to be too open full time. Under new CDC guidelines, that transmission is airborne. Even more precautions are going to be needed and six feet of distance is under safe limit. Should be more distance and cannot be achieved with school open full time. Keeping our case load down by erring on side of safety will continue to benefit our community as a whole, timely and prepare us for the future, better for the future. You jump to premature you jump too prematurely can make a change, could result in a complete shutdown, driving our county into a dangerous position. This is hard times for all, and hybrid is keeping the community leveled. A good time for reconsideration would be spring. Parents should be given more leeway to submit assignments to include weekend work if needed and expand mark absence timing. Douglas Chapman. 2024 Preakness Place. Our children and the parents deserve the option of full time five days a week of in person learning. As science continues to evolve, it becomes more and more apparent that the risk to our children is very, very low. We allow education, nutrition, mental health, socialization, and other issues be put aside at the cost of a two one thousandth percent chance of a fully recoverable virus for our children. It is the parent's choice to accept that risk. Stop dictating and listen to your students' parents. Five days a week options now. Susan Musselman, 257 West 7th Street. I am in favor of a continued hybrid schedule. 
Five days a week would not allow for necessary social distancing, nor is it fair or ethical to place our teachers in situations even more difficult that they currently face. Reversing an effective plan at the beginning of cold and flu season will hold unnecessary consequences. Thank you and good luck. Kirsten Rodriguez, 561 Glen Oaks Drive. Most schools around us are returning to five days a week. All of Madison County is returning soon. By avoiding children's proper educational needs, you are failing our children. I work full time all day, come on to unfinished work and have to spend two to three hours fighting with my children to complete their work. I end up doing it for them because they give up. They used to love school. Now they cry, they hate it. They are not socialized and their mental states are in a low place. They get no outside time most days and are not learning anything. They need to return to school five days a week. We go to church, shop, play at parks, go to the zoo, and I've worked at Honda through all of this. Nothing bad is happening. They need to return. Stop failing our children. If you care anything about their proper education, you will return them. Parents are doing the best we can that our children need more. That is the sole purpose of school. John Kern, 1027 Valley Drive. Please reconsider going 100% remote from Thanksgiving to mid-January. It is important for our children to be in school. It is vital to at-risk students to attend. Local companies are working. COVID-19 poses little risk to children and healthy working teachers. I urge you to continue allowing hybrid schedule or full 100% in person. 100% remote is not warranted and will damage the district's relations with the community. Tara Gower, 656 Arabian Circle, Marysville, Ohio. I have several concerns with this hybrid model and its efficacy. I am extremely concerned about my oldest daughter and what has been deemed enough class time for her. We decided to keep her back in kindergarten because she was part of the red, blue, every other kindergarten. And as we learned then, it was simply not enough time in the classroom. She has since been placed on an IEP and has overcome numerous learning disabilities to begin making strides in her education, only to have that momentum terminated. When this hybrid model was considered, I felt like too little thought was put into her and children like her that were just barely getting by. I am concerned that if she does not go back into school soon, she will not be able to regain traction. She also she has also struggled slightly with self-esteem issues in the past, maybe feeling like she is not smart, as smart as everyone else. Hybrid learning has caused these issues to increase exponentially. She is struggling with unified classroom, locating her assignments, and in turn is feeling completely alone not to mention the difficulty she has learning new concepts in general. She has started having major anxiety symptoms such as stomach aches and sleepiness, sleeplessness and spends a good part of her remote school time in tears. She is like a different child on Monday and Tuesday morning when she actually gets to go to school. How much are we going to let these children suffer? Let's also talk about the undue hardship this is putting on parents as well. Parents are expected to be available to teach your children while holding down full-time jobs. This is not realistic. Employers are losing patience with this practice. Parents are succumbing to the stress of trying to do it all. Also expecting parents to suddenly come up with money for daycare is unrealistic as well. So many are just barely getting by. Many families can comfortably leave their children alone for an hour or two but to have them home alone all day and trying to teach themselves is ridiculous. In my opinion, this has gone on long enough. The curve has been flattened and it is time to put a stop to this. It is time for everyone to have an acceptable option of education or education. Jacob McCombs, 547 Clydesdale Way. I am writing to formally express my concerns and raise awareness to the experience that has been remote learning. As with the other students, my son has been forced into a remote learning model since March of 2020. Since this time, the online learning has been a task my son dreads. Other times the material is not clear, there are many apps to juggle, 
attachments, online assignments do not work, and retaining the material from his two days in the classroom seem impossible at times. Our family is not one who has the luxury of dedicating time towards school during the business day. As a result, my son has to complete his assignments in the evening, juggling sports and extracurriculars with his education. I'm very concerned how the hybrid model will affect my son and others in the community's long-term success in academics. Other schools have begun attending classes four days a week. Why is it unsafe for MEVSD to adopt a similar program? Stacy Adams, 4509 Dog Road, Marysville, Ohio. Please consider at least a five day week option for our elementary students. My husband was laid off from his full time job back in April and has been working two part job, time jobs to make ends meet. We've had to put our two kids in daycare during the remote learning days and it's breaking us financially. We keep our heads above water for another month, but come November 1, we're going to have to choose between paying the mortgage and paying the $1,500 plus per month for daycare that we've had to take on. We just can't afford it. Every daycare in town that we've talked to is requiring us to pay for full time even though they're just, they'll just go three days uh, because of how they have to staff. We appreciate the district trying to link us up with people who can provide child care and that's not the problem. But that's not the problem. It's like handing someone a list of home builders after they just told you that they aren't going to be able to come up with the mortgage because of the situation you put them in. I know a lot of families who are putting this sudden daycare expense on their credit card. We can't do this for much longer and certainly not for the whole year if the school board digs in its heels and refuses to send our kids back full time. This is going to lead to bankruptcies and people losing their houses if we have to do this the whole year. It's going to be even worse in several months. My husband and I are scared to death that the school system that we pay our taxes to is going to destroy us if this keeps up. The board has barely acknowledged what this is doing to families financially. I feel all along that the superintendent and the board have ignored not only the financial impact of their decisions, but also what this is doing to elementary age kids who have almost no structure and social interaction right now. We love Marysville schools and we love our kids teachers even more. I didn't use my real name on here because I don't want my kids' teachers to think we don't appreciate them and because I'm embarrassed of our current financial situation. Adrian Green, 21655 Shirk Road, Marysville, Ohio. Good afternoon, board members. My name is Adrian Green and I'm the parent of a first grader at Raymond Elementary. Teachers and staff at Raymond do an amazing job make the most of a limited time of students. Based off viewing the most recent board of, of education meeting, I have concerns. A clear lack of plan or criteria to evaluate our educational model to move back to a five-day in-person option for students. There are larger districts throughout the state, several districts around ours moving to five days in person, Jonathan Alder, North Union, and Logan County Schools, etc. If there are restrictions, why not continue to partner with parents to get feedback slash compromise? Survey families in the hybrid model. Allow those that are not the option to shift to the virtual academy. If transportation continues to be an issue, find out if parents are willing to pick up. If insurance restrictions require six feet social distancing, are there negotiations for a compromise with the company? talking to other larger districts for best practices, evaluating switching to the insurance provider that surrounding districts utilize. Five, option to allow buildings to go back full time who may not have a staffing issue. Our students deserve a high quality education. The hybrid model two is not able to deliver for childhood education needs. I'm extremely frustrated and disappointed with the lack of action from the board to improve the situation for our children. I understand you may feel that the hybrid model is the best for the district right now, but you have shown this is not a data-driven decision. Where are the established criteria for this decision? Where is the plan for continued evaluation on the appropriate learning model? 
Where is the feedback for families that wish to continue two day only versus five day? The current model is not sufficient replacement for in person instruction from our fantastic teachers. The increases in screen time, emotional and mental stress are causing more damage to our students' development than COVID 19. Parents in our community have been sacrificing to partner with you in this unprecedented time, but not having a plan is not an acceptable solution for our community. Thank you, Adrian Green. Matthew uh, Naguet, 443 Triple Crown Way. Marysville board members, I am writing this letter to stress some concerns that I have regarding decisions that are being made for the 2021 20, school year. I want to be clear that my issues do not stem from the direction the school board has decided to take in terms of the hybrid and virtual models thus far. My disconnect lies in the strategy or lack of in terms of moving forward and the insufficient transparency of guidelines in place to return to instructional model one. I am overall pleased with the current state and direction the school board has taken thus far. My question to you is where do we go from here? It appears that there doesn't seem to be an urgency or plan to switch to Model 1 strategy in the foreseeable future. A common response we keep hearing is that the school board has decided on a plan that they feel is in the best interest of the students and staff. When asked to provide steps moving forward, we have received the response that you are waiting to see how things progress before making any further decisions. This wait and see approach is unacceptable. There needs to be a thorough and detailed plan decided by data and facts to make decisions regarding our children's education moving forward. The main concerns and questions I have are as follows. Number one, what criteria have you established that validates a safe environment resulting in the pursuit of the safe for all to return model? A, what do the COVID-19 statistics need to be in order to consider or move forward with this model? B, what recommendations are you following to make such decisions? C, what mandates need to be lifted by the governor to allow for proper distancing or transportation logistics to realistically occur? D, is there a plan to return to a full-time model if a vaccine does not come to fruition? E, what timelines have you established to reconvene and evaluate metrics to determine if the current state of the virus has met the criteria you all established and deemed safe in returning to a full-time learning environment. I thank you all for the time and opportunity to present the questions that I have outlined. I look forward to seeing a transparent and well-communicated plan moving forward regarding the direction the school board is taking. Whitney Swatson Trooper, 18003 Allen Center Road. My kids need to go to school all day, every day. Please follow in North Union's footsteps. Matt uh, Naguat, 443 Triple Crown Way, Marysville. My concern is the fact that for the past couple of weeks, all that we have heard are reasons to validate why we can't go with a five day a week model. We continue to hear reasons for and have not heard what we are doing to prepare to return to, five, to the five-day model. That leads us parents to assume the district has no intentions of even considering to put together a plan to return to a full-time model. All while the surrounding districts are finding a way, I understand the powers to be have made their decision on what they feel is the best plan for the students and staff. Well, I'm sorry, but I don't believe I speak on behalf of a well, I'm sorry, but I believe I speak on the behalf of a lot of parents who feel they know what is in the best interest of their children. And that they feel like keeping the kids home for their protection to each their own. Many parents feel overall health and a solid educational experience is optimal for their children. I ask what is the board's threshold or benchmark in terms of a goal to consider going back to a full-time model? What do the COVID numbers have to be? Does a vaccine need to be present? What are the measurables that we are being graded against? Has the criteria even been established? If not, shame on the board. If we do not have criteria established to meet a threshold that the board deems safe, 
then how will we ever get to an adequate learning environment? It's easy not to be transparent and keep playing the wait and see approach while parents hang in limbo. Fortunately for me, I'm able to be home with my kids and childcare is not an issue. That's not the case for majority of families. The board owes it to the children and parents to establish a plan to return full time. And even if we do not get to that point, at least there was an effort in trying. A goal without a plan is just a thought. What happens in the event that COVID does not go away like many viruses don't? What if there is no vaccine? Meanwhile, surrounding districts are going back successfully. So a year from now, Marysville decides to return and the COVID conditions remain the same. Yet, then it's okay to return full time? Well, at that point, our kids have already been out of five day a week schooling for a year. How long does the board intend to continue with hybrid learning? I have said it many times on many forums. I'm not pushing for our children to return tomorrow or next week or even next month, but I want to see a fully developed plan with specific criteria and metrics to meet, to meet that the board has agreed upon to return full time. This information needs to be shared with all parents, students, teachers, and staff. We at least deserve that. We deserve better. More importantly, our children deserve better. Renee Denniston, 1550 Foxfire Drive, Marysville, Ohio. Hello. My question is regarding the potential of all remote learning from Thanksgiving until Christmas. If it is decided to go 100% remote during that time, does the school's plan on stopping all extracurricular activities as well? If it is too risky to even be in the classroom at a hybrid level, then I would think it is too risky to allow for any activities such as sports, clubs, training, etc. that are affiliated with the school. I am curious what the board will do if 100% remote is decided on and what your decision will be. Thanks for taking my question. Casey Command, 1215 Sassafras Lane. It would be great if everyone who chooses to go to in-person school five days a week could do so. One of my daughters is on a hybrid schedule and I just think she would learn her best if she was in school five days a week. She becomes more motivated with the help and encouragement of others. She also learns new skills when being around others that sometimes we don't think of doing at home. Lauren Crane, 490, Mass Road, Marysville. My children attend Dunsold and Creekview. I found Superintendent Diane Allen's rationale for continuing on with MEBSD's current approach in order to maintain social distancing very convincing. The hybrid approach is undoubtedly a hardship for families. However, we know COVID has been present in our schools over the past weeks and going to five days a week would not allow social distancing to continue. Sending groups of kids home erratically to quarantine for two weeks here and there without warning seems likely to be even more of a hardship as we get deeper into winter. Not to mention that Doing away with social distancing also puts our kids and teachers' health at higher risk. These are hard times, and there is no good answer here, only the least bad answer. Our family moved to Marysville last year in large part for the schools here. Under the current circumstances, which some districts are managing much better than others, we cannot be happier with our choice. It has been comforting to us to see how thoughtfully these problems have been approached. A huge thank you to the teachers, administrators, and board members for all their hard work. And thank you for creating this avenue for community members to comment on this issue. Well, thank you, thank you very much, Jonathan. And uh, thank you to all of those who submitted the letters. Uh, I just want everyone to know that we hear the frustrations, we hear the challenges. The, I'm at the end of my rope feelings. We also acknowledge that there are those who are happy with the current model. Um, you know, I, I think that uh, we're going to have a superintendent's report and you know, listening to those letters, it's, it's clear that having that, you know, some kind of a tentative timeline, frequently revisiting, 
um, you know, we know the importance of communication, and uh, so I, I know I'm, I'm looking forward to your report and some conversation with the board here uh, as we move forward. So perfect. And, and also, let, I also just want to say that you know I think there were a couple of letters in there that might uh, might require some some direct follow up. Uh, you know I think about that Washington trip rescheduling. Um, so as always, if there's follow up required, I, I know that will take place, and you will keep us updated. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Um, so as you know, uh, we sent a video out um, Tuesday morning. Uh, in which we kind of uh, answered some of the questions from last meeting and kind of gave, I would say, an overall uh, state of the state. Uh, at the beginning of the year, <clears throat> we sent several communications. We had some parents ask us to back off a little bit uh, as they were getting inundated with uh, the beginning of the school year information from parents. Um, so we'll be kicking that back up uh, on a uh, a more regular basis now that people are kind of settled in. Um, <clears throat> I wanted to provide for you a current case count. Uh, currently, we have uh, four students uh, who are who have tested positive. Uh, we have 12 recovered. Uh, we have 31 students currently quarantined. <clears throat> Staff, we have two staff members who are currently who have who are currently positive for covid we have four uh, staff members who are recovered and we have 18 staff members currently quarantined so we have a total of 22 positive um, cases in the district either current or recovered and a total of 49 um, individuals in quarantine so what I, as you know, in last meeting, and again, it, and most of the video was really a recap of our last boarding, board meeting, a lot of the information I shared with you. So Kim, uh, Jude, and I today spent some time modeling with the current quarantine numbers of 49, what that in fact might mean. And again, it's a predictive model, but uh, if we went with minimum type situations in a five, um, day week model with 100% attendance where we would forego social distancing in most spaces. It would be approximately 265 students who would have been quarantined um, and uh, 17, we, for the staff it was a bit of a struggle because some of those staff members are possibly a custodian or a coach. So we really didn't apply a predictive model to that due to the multiple nuances, but certainly uh, with students um, did that. Just to kind of, and that's what we've been doing since the school year um, has started. Uh, over the weekend, there were four uh, or five cases that came in um, since we, we talked uh, last Thursday to, to Monday. Um, our attendance rate for A and B days and C days uh, still remain 96% uh, or higher. Um, so we feel pretty good about that. And that was one of those indicators that, yes? Oh, uh, no, I, I just want to kind of, can I go back and just ask a quick question? You said that when you were coming up with the number of kids quarantine or number of people quarantine, and you said with 100% attendance, were you talking about 100% of the 85% that are coming? So of kids that are currently yes. coming to school. Right. At, at, so we didn't factor in any virtual Ooh, kids right. coming back or anything like that. The important thing okay. to remember, and that's later in my report, okay. not only have families selected Virtual Academy, which has taken out um, 960 students approximately, right. but we have also removed 28 staff members to educate those students. So our model for virtual academy is a bit different. Uh, some districts have purchased a product, the student logs into that product and works on that all day, and there's no connection or very little connection back to the school. Mm -hmm. Ours is actually facilitated by teaching staff, right. um, and what that looks like varies between elementary school and high school, obviously, 
but we did dedicate staff um, as we all talked uh, beginning of the school year ha uh, about the importance of relationships and right. that's why we chose that model so right. um, I think that's important to know and I'll, I'll talk about that as well Thank you. so we even um, we went on the the current numbers we did not move virtual Academy back or we do believe that and we will do some some talking to parents as well if we go back five days a week we do believe that we will have some people come back from virtual but we that we would sense that more people may choose to go virtual um, which would which would put more stress on need for staffing in the virtual academy if that makes sense we're, we're teetering on capacity with that um, currently with virtual academy Okay. I, now I know the, the state has just come up with a dashboard yes. and I think it, you told us in our last meeting and I think it's been reported in the media that Marysville has the dubious distinction of having more reported cases with COVID than any other school district in the state. Is that correct? That's my understanding. I have not been on that dashboard. Uh, today and I don't know when that gets updated on a regular basis yeah. um, but as of last week uh, we were definitely number one in Central Ohio uh, and um, then we were ranked number one in the state and someone came back and said maybe we shifted and I haven't been on there today uh, or in the past couple of days to be fair to really see where that's at. And I know the reason I asked that was I know many of the people that wrote letters and for everyone that wrote letters please understand every single note letter phone call somebody hears somebody reads and in almost all cases it's a, a very quick response to it um, but many of them said I uh, know there was there was one letter or email we got a week or so ago where the gentleman said we're at level one. Well, by the time we got the email, our county was at level two. So I know things are changing very rapidly. Mm -hmm. And I mentioned last week that we only had 17 days of school. And today we're at about 22, 23 days of school, mm -hmm. which is a fairly short period of time and not a lot of experience but we do have to some degree we do have COVID within our school system it's impacting not only the students but it's also uh, and maybe in some ways in terms of planning uh, it's impacting our staff mm -hmm. so thank you and and as we talked at the beginning of the school year and I think I spoke be frankly we, we obviously don't want anyone to get COVID that's that's not what, what I'm stating um, however we do know from talking to like our, our the medical advisory team you know the the consequences appear to be at this point relatively um, low impact for children uh, now again that's only going to be as good as people keep up with the research but that that's what it indicates the more troublesome side would be uh, staff, staff, older staff, staff with multiple um, factors uh, that would impact them not having maybe as quick as recovery. Uh, I've expressed openly the entire time we struggle to get substitute teachers on a regular basis um, and even more so now during COVID. So, um, I would also encourage people who are interested in subbing to reach out and get on our substitute list because um, we would need those as well. But those are factors also that we need to keep in mind is how this impacts the adults in our organization, the bus drivers, as well as teachers, custodians, um, all of those members. Um, so we, we've talked all summer I feel like last spring and into this year about several priorities and I really tried to, to hone in on those um, number one our priority is to provide a safe and healthy environment for for all students staff 
uh, our families um, access to uh, learning and instructors. So that certainly looked a little different in the spring than it does now. So that's been a, a constant priority. Uh, also, we prioritize the social emotional well-being of our students um, throughout that time and trying to look at the best ways to make connections with them and support uh, unique circumstances and uh, of individual students and groups of students and really try to create uh, situations that provided consistency and stability for parents. Um, and, and so those, those four factors continue to be at the forefront of looking at instructional models, what's happening on those uh, remote days. I know parents have given the principal some great feedback and changes are taking place based on that feedback. I, I heard one of the examples in, in a letter today about the, you know, pushing back assignment due dates to weekends or being cognizant of those demands. And I, I know those have all been topics of conversation in our, our meetings. So, so the changes and the, uh, I don't want to use the word survey, but the contact with parents and, and uh, feedback uh, is taking place at the building level? Yes, every principal at this point has completed some kind of feedback um, loop survey to parents um, and most of the concerns, and it, it's highly aligned to our letter letters, um, would be on those remote days. Um, so one of the questions we have posed is, so when we think about remote days, Specifically, Wednesday seems to not be as big of an issue as the opposing days. So if I'm an A kid, my B day, or if I'm a B kid, my A day. Um, so one of the questions we have posed uh, and talked a bit about is really, what could we do? How could we rethink and repurpose staff to create more adult contact with students on their remote day? Um, so if a student gets stuck or a parent is unavailable to help, what are, what are some additional avenues we can create for families? So that is in the works currently on those off days. Um, and I think that today I was a part of a brainstorming session that um, really had some great ideas. We've, we've hired a, a dedicated sub in each building. So uh, using that dedicated sub maybe differently. When students are on mass brace outside, you know, spread out, or is there a possibility for teacher to hold a Zoom session then or for the guaranteed sub to come out and monitor that work while the teacher would stay in the building? So we are looking for um, more ways to build those connections between adults and the learners at home on those remote days. And again, that was based on the, the parent feedback to us as well. Um, certainly, it, you know, there are constraints with any model. We've talked about that. Um, and, cert, and that access to staff is a, a constraint with the hybrid model. Uh, we've heard that. Um, we've talked a bit about constraints with the five-day-a-week model I just expressed to you. Some of this might be repetitive. Uh, the sub pool. We are concerned with uh, an increase of people coming back, uh, increase of quarantines. Uh, it's important to know that actually a quarantine is 14 days, um, which in many times is longer than um, if you're out for the illness. And some of the situations we have uh, talked to other school districts about um, is, for example, a teacher uh, may have children of their own in the district, the student gets quarantined, then maybe a member of the house gets sick, and then another one is quarantined. So some quarantines can really add up to nearly 40 days um, of absence. So uh, that has been an obstacle in some other districts we've talked to. So that would be one of those things we need to, to keep in mind if we do look at an, a model that would forego social distancing. Uh, I already talked about the staff members we've dedicated to Virtual Academy. 
Um, so one of the um, pieces we've tried to look at um, since the beginning of the year is if people come back and we look at room size and we have, let's say, of course it never works out perfectly. So maybe in first grade you have two extras and in third grade you have five extras and in fourth grade, but there's not a, you couldn't really bring them together in one classroom uh, to facilitate learning. So maybe there would have to be shifting of buildings. So it, it's, it's, that part is something we're still looking at as far as do we have available space? Can we get an adult in there to teach in that space um, so, in order to offset some of those pieces? It's like a ginormous puzzle. Yeah, so we have, let's say, a building, uh, I'll use Raymond, they've got two first grade classrooms. Mm -hmm. And so with the remote learning, one of the first grade teachers is doing the virtual academy. So we have, I'm making all of this up to okay. have no idea what, what Raymond's situation actually is. But because of smaller school, for me, it's easier to figure out. I've got two classrooms. One teacher is going to the virtual academy. Mm -hmm. Now, if we go to five day instruction, and we have more kids come back than the one teacher that remains in the classroom can handle. To put kids in that second classroom requires hiring additional staff. Correct. Okay. I think Thank the you. best example would be a high school example. So, so if yeah. we had a teacher that moved to remote, we collapsed their entire schedule. Okay. So they had an eight period a day schedule. Okay. I know they're on block, but yeah. eight period a day we collapse that schedule and move that person to to work with virtual kids and they have a place load of 150 kids in virtual as mm -hmm. well so if we <clears throat> open back up and if we want to stay socially distanced i don't have we don't have the staff to pick up those other people and right. keep people okay. socially distanced all right thank you yep uh uh, and we've we've had a commitment to the the two layers of protection. I, I would think is another thing that's been kind of a, a, an important factor. So we're always looking for two uh, two things: a mask and six feet, a bar a desk barrier and six feet. So we will, we've stuck to try not stuck. We've committed to that um, on on behalf of the health department's really recommendation. Um, obviously, we talked last time that bringing everyone back, even when kids are still out for the virtual school, I think that's an important part. I'm glad you brought that up. Um, we would compromise that that six feet. Right. It's it's I guess the easiest way to say it. In a dream world, 28 kids would have come out of one class and gone to virtual school, and 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 the teacher would have gone with them. But that's certainly not. How it happened you have so many kids in first grade and second grade right and I know I mean we've heard from from the surrounding districts I mean they have made the comments that we realize we're not going to be able to social distance mm -hmm. and you know we've heard Jason's comments you know it's it, it's his recommendation he does understand that in some areas of our county the outbreak lo levels are lower mm -hmm. um, in Marysville we're experiencing more here yes so um, but, but it, that, that is, that's always a choice. Right now, I guess it's out there. And yeah, and the schools that we're comparing to, they have a lot less numbers, they think, than our school has. Mm -hmm. So uh, Fairbanks has had zero positive tests, and North Union has not had any either. Right. So certainly that is um, a, 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 factor. A, a factor as well. Mm -hmm. <laughs> right, right. And, and really what's kind of interesting, though, Amy, it's like if you look, there's really no rhyme or reason as far as districts and their choices mm -hmm. of, of how they are bringing kids back in and how they're teaching them because you have some small districts that are like a thousand students that are doing hybrid. Right, right. And then you have, you know, I saw one 4,900 student that is doing five days a week. Mm -hmm. And then you have some 3,000 students that are all remote, right. you know, so it's, right. it's all across the board and it kind of comes back to, 
you know, you need to look at your numbers. That, that's what's important in your district and in your community. So, well, and I've definitely reached out to other superintendents. I heard that question in one of the letters in a five day a week right um, districts and asked, right. "What are you doing, and how are you doing that?" Um, most of the time, not 100% of the time, they are able to um, get six feet distancing with all of their kids returning. Mm -hmm. um, and and that, that would be one major difference, I would say, in the conversations I've had. Okay, so uh, I've got a couple of questions. But before I do, if I, part of what we're dealing with is we don't have good data. Okay, we don't even know nationally what's happening with the schools. The people are starting to try to get that data, but we approximately 50% of the schools in the country are hybrid. Approximately 25% are five day a week, and approximately 25% are entirely virtual. So we're like right in the middle. But the one of the crucial things that we need to know, I think, in order to move forward, because what a lot of these parents are saying is it's not just that they're having trouble with the hybrid model, they're feeling like we're not doing anything to move forward. And one of the things that we could do to move forward is get a handle on how it's transmitted in the schools. Okay, and I think that we as a country are not doing that great. We're, there's a lot of things that aren't known that we could possibly be doing better at figuring out, but that's maybe something we could do here as well. Not just keep track of the numbers of how many kids and how many teachers are infected, but how did they get it? and start to try to get some handle on what are we doing that's working and what are we doing that's not. So that, because one of, one of the questions was, how long are we going to go on like this? Right. What if there isn't a vaccine for two years? Mm -hmm. Are we going to do this for two years? Well, no, if we can learn what we do that keeps it from being transmitted in the buildings. If we can get clearer about that, is it the shields, is it the masks, is it the distance, is it the ventilation? You follow me? Yes, so, so what I would like to know is, is as much as we can figure out about how people are getting it. I know that's a tall order. Yeah. So I can answer that. At this point, uh, talking to the health department, all of the cases that have been positive are something that people have been exposed to outside of school. They are not seeing that we are do having any issues with transmission as of today within the building. So what it, what it appears like so far, and it's only what four weeks because it's in the building. This is week five. Yeah, yeah we're at week five. So now. it's still right. early, but it looks like what we're doing now is either working, or there's just not anybody in the buildings with it anyway. So no matter what we do, it's not going to be transmitted. You follow me? Mm -hmm. So the question is, can we go back to five days a week, where among other things the distance goes down? See, if we could answer that question, then we could say, all right, even if the numbers aren't great, we could possibly go to five days a week because what we're doing in the buildings is not transmitting it, and it's not because of the distance. It's because of something else, maybe the masks, right? Or so the two have... factors are distance and time. So distance, time. if you're within six feet and you're exposed to that person for 15 minutes collectively, it could be at a to it's a, a total of 15 cumulative, minutes. Right. Thank you, cumulative. <laughs> um, then those are the factors that go into um, deciding, for example, if you're quarantined. Right, that's a guideline. No, that's that. That's not been established as that's what it takes to transmit it. We Correct. We don't know exactly Cor what it takes. Correct, but when we're talking about student absences, that right. is what will impact us quickly. So. If I test positive and Todd is in with, within six feet of me for 15 minutes, he'll be quarantined for the 14 days. So I do, he may get it and he may not get it. But that, those are the two factors that go into quarantine and would create more disruption. Right, so let's, let, me, let me put this as a question then. You, I mean, you heard the parents that are saying, what are we doing mm -hmm. to move out of this model? Are there things that we're already looking at that, that might allow us 
to put the kids back in five days a week, even if the numbers stay about where they are. I'm talking about the numbers in Ohio or the numbers in Union County. Mm -hmm. Here's another thing I think that we have to factor in, Brian. Where are the children going and where are they picking it up outside? So I think that we also have to go back on, on saying to the parents, you know, if we're not transmitting it at the school, but they're bringing it into the school, what are you doing outside of the school to prevent them from getting it? Well, to bring a, it into other right, children. That's a great point because if, think about this, if they're in school two days a week, where are they for the other three? If they're going to some daycare center and there's transmission there, this might actually be worse. This model might actually be worse for transmission than in five days. If the schools are safe, you follow me? If they're not transmitting it at the schools, sending them home three days a week, maybe putting them in locations where they're more likely to get it and bring it to the teachers the other parts of the week. That's not what the health department has said as places they're getting it. They're, so it's been... Um, it's not daycare centers? Correct. Great. And again, our K-6 numbers are relatively low. Uh, so as you uh, look at, at the numbers, um, and then 712 seems to be, um, in particular, our middle school seems to uh, be uh, leading our, our number range. Um, so are there things, are there concrete things that, and I'm not saying that we can answer this yet, but are there, mm -hmm. are there possibilities of thing, concrete things we could do in the buildings that would allow them to be back five days a week and still have these these low transmission rates? So I think there's some large assumptions to be made. If that transmission rate is limited because of the distance and face masks, the distance will be compromised when we bring people five five days a week, you know, and so that I guess that's in part how I would answer your question. Um, the other uh, kind of larger mass areas we are looking at, so when kids gather, for example, for lunch, we're trying to look at how, and, and I've talked to some buildings that are in five days a week, how you might better manage that. Right now, for example, at the high school, we have two kids per table. Uh, if we doubled the numbers in there, we could not continue that space. So we're looking at those as well. Um, and a lot of places are going back to classrooms and eating um, in order to uh, get that space. So we are looking at some of those best practices that are happening in other places um, that are five days a week. I think <clears throat> I have not talked to one now. Uh, Fairbanks will be one and so will North Union yet that have been five days a week and not had six feet. So um, there is a, a case that came up this week and I have a call into that superintendent to talk to them about their, mm -hmm. um, how things are working at their building. Um, so we'll, we are continuing to look at those things. There's also, I'm just throwing things out now because I, I hear a sense of desperation from a lot of these parents. Mm -hmm. And part of it is what they're dealing with at home, but the other part of it is, how can we go on like this for nine months? Mm -hmm. So I'm, I'm thinking about what things might change the status quo. And one thing might be we learn more, like we learn, oh, it's really not the distance, or it's really not the masks, or it really is, and then we can really focus on that, and that might open up some possibilities. Mm -hmm. Another thing that may be on the horizon is a lot more testing. There are companies that are working on tests that will be fairly inexpensive and you know almost like a pregnancy test mm -hmm. something you can take at home maybe with saliva if something like that comes around let's say in the next month or two mm -hmm. maybe that's the sort of thing that we could really add to the equation and say look if we test our kids every couple of weeks maybe we can get them back in five five days a week does mm -hmm. that make sense right mm -hmm. so so I, I, I guess what I'm saying is I want to be I want us to be proactive about this it sounds like the parents feel like we're just settled, like we have this plan and that's it. 
Is that is that your approach to this? No, I mean, I, my next part. I mean, we already had a medical advisory team meetings set up next week uh, to talk about um, what they're seeing and what the current research is indicating about uh, child transmission. Their advice the whole time has kind of been what I articulated today about uh, with children. Um, I. Again, I want to say I don't want anyone to get sick, but with children, it, it does not seem uh, to be as impactful as adults. Their advice has always been a concern about um, staff. Um, so we're going to revisit that topic. And um, then the superintendent's task force, which is made up of community members, parents, um, et cetera, we're meeting again next week to kind of look at that and um, go over those priorities that I just talked about and talk about next steps as well and feedback um, so all of those things it's, it's not a status quo um, i do think that this four first four weeks of school it was a heavy lift for our staff and we're really trying to figure out how to do some things um, and at that point uh, you know that's where the absolute focus needed to be getting kids here finding kids getting everything reassociated. Um, as you know, in the summer, I said it makes a whole lot of sense to try to commit to one level for nine weeks. Nine weeks is up October 16th, I think, uh, in that range, um, <clears throat> because we don't wanna hop in and out of models. That's why we didn't align to the state system. As Mr. Smith mentioned, we're yellow one week, orange, that means we would have been jumping back and forth between those levels and we did not want to do that. We wanted to commit because we know that's in the best interest of kids uh, for as, as long as possible. So there's been no intent to, to stay status quo, um, but I, I would be remiss if I didn't say we, we had some things to work out in the first three weeks because we've never done this before. So you're think, you're um, thinking in nine week blocks, is that fair? Yeah, I mean, that's what we're doing for nine weeks. That's mm -hmm. not the same as saying we're doing this for nine months. Correct. Right. And we've also, just like we ask parents who chose virtual, you know, we want you to make that commitment for a trimester or whatever, the, or a semester, so we don't have all the transitions for students. Um, that The goal is to limit, limit some of those things. Yeah. And what transitions for students is challenging and then transitions for staff as well. I mean, we want our staff to be as effective as possible. And, you know, I was checking a couple other surrounding districts and two of them were aligned to the state color code. And their plan was, if the color changes on Thursday, we'll let you know on Friday what the instructional model is going to be on Monday. But, oh my, I mean, I think that would be incredibly challenging as, as a parent. And so, but I, I do hear from the letters, and I think, you know, we can always improve, we can always do a better job with our communications. And so, just having, you know, being clear that we didn't come into this thinking we're going to do it for the whole year, you know, but obviously we weren't clear enough in saying, we'd like to commit to at least a semester. You know, maybe some of that stuff was on the, paperwork and as you're meeting with your advisory committee, you feel like, oh, this is common knowledge, you know? So I think it's important to continually make, you know, talk about these things and communicate. We're not sticking to this for the whole year, or we haven't committed to sticking to this for the whole year right now. We're constantly looking at data and, you know, remember that a lot of these decisions were made based on information that we had back in July. And as we all know, that's changing sometimes on a daily basis. So, you know, as we move forward, we're gonna to continue to reevaluate, base our decisions on the most current information. And so, yeah, I kind of struggle when people said, we want specific metrics. Well, when I look at all the different districts out there and all of the different plans, that tells me that, you know, People are using a variety of metrics, and many of those metrics are, you know, are, are information about them. Guidelines continue to change, so I, it's just it's an incredibly challenging situation. And, and if it wasn't, we'd see 
districts doing the same thing. But they're not. So, I, I, you know, I think, I just think, you know, it is important for us to, to listen to these letters and to see are there, are there common themes that tell us what we need to do a better job. Yeah. I think it's also important we continue to listen to the health officials. Yeah, oh yeah. You know, um, right. you know and, and I know that, you know, I mean, I have grandchildren I love to see in school, but at the same time, I don't want to risk their health. Right. You know, I, I like the hybrid metal, I mean, you know, for them, looking, mm -hmm. talking as an outside, you know, because I don't want to compromise, I don't want to see their health compromised, mm -hmm. and because that's why we have professionals in the health field, and that in uh, Mr. Orsina and everything else to guide us what we need to do. Mm -hmm. so. one, one of the things I'd like to, to bring up, really, I think, a, a couple of small points that we did, I don't think you heard from the letter, but you and I heard mm -hmm. from the couple that we talked to. Uh, this summer, Diane said, you know, we're going to plan for the worst and hope for the best and be prepared to turn on a dime. Mm -hmm. And the couple had in mind changing on a dime, going from the hybrid to five days in class, but I shared with them that the decision, many sleepless nights on the part of our superintendent, was whether or not we could go hybrid and whether we should be all remote mm -hmm. at the start of the year. And I told them that we were probably about this close. Please make sure you get this on the camera. We we're about this close <laughs> okay, to, to everybody being virtual. Yes. Mm -hmm. And that the move was, you know, the, the stretch, if you want to look at it that way, was to go to the hybrid mm -hmm. model. And that the turn on the dime was to make a reverse and go back right. to the, the online model. Right. The other, and so, you know, it was not an easy decision. And the hybrid was really an effort to try to get the kids as much contact, give them as much social, emotional help, and so forth, as we felt was safe. The second thing, we're, you know, we've been talking about all the different models and the metrics and things, and for me, from the national government, state government, uh, local health department, everybody that is a medical professional, and we hear a lot of things from other people, politicians, etc. But the people that are the medical professionals have been extremely consistent that mask and six feet make a huge difference. And if I understand correctly, there isn't any way we can maintain six feet distance between our staff and the kids if we bring everybody back. In every single classroom? No. Okay. There are a handful of classrooms throughout the district. The answer to that question would be yes, mm -hmm. but not not a majority. Okay. I have a spreadsheet I can share yeah. with the board. If and, you and so, to me, that's one, you know, the medical professionals, if we're looking to make a change, the medical professionals, for me, need to provide some additional guidance as to the distance and the effectiveness. I think it goes toward Brian's point. Are we, are we learning the inf information and so forth? The other thing was that uh, while, and, and I think we all know, kids don't seem to get as sick. They get the virus, but their experience with it is not as severe. But one of the other aspects was them being the point of contact for other people in the community, and we've, we've talked about that, but I think uh, that is, is also, uh, you know, going back to Brian, what is our experience in terms of, of uh, the contact? We know kids are getting the virus, and Hopefully they're not coming to school. Mom and dad hopefully are taking temperatures and making sure that they stay away. But uh, that may not all, always be the case. And so 
I keep saying, you know, we, hey, we're only in this for 20, at this point, 22 days or 23 days, something like that. I need, I need more time to, to see. I think 20 days of experience uh, makes me uncomfortable to make a decision uh, that has potentially uh, significant impact on people's lives. And I know, uh, you know, our staff, we have staff that are dedicated to trying to address the social emotional issues. It's not something we're not cognizant of. It's not something that as a school district we're not trying to address. I know it's terribly difficult and every kid's situation is going to be, be a little bit different. But uh, uh, I know that, you know, we have said we're not going to be tied to the governor's map, uh, that we're going to be looking more local in terms of what our internal experience is. Uh, and uh, I, I think, as we've kind of, kind of talked about it a little bit, if we're looking at the end of the nine weeks, we're getting some more information, we're talking to the professionals, we're talking to your advisory board, uh, and so forth, we're going to gain some information. And uh, uh, there's not a single one of us in this room that believes that not having kids in class uh, is a good thing. Uh, we desperately want that. That has been our goal. And uh, uh, to this point, you know, I think as a district we have tried to do that in the safest way possible uh, without putting grandparents, parents, the teachers, bus drivers, and everybody else at risk. Uh, you know, we look at the kids, but there's more people involved in this than just the kids. Uh, so thank you for letting me. Oh, so, excuse me. Do you, Diane, do you want, are you planning to address the um, the break? I don't know what you call that break from yeah, Thanksgiving November, to January. Yeah, November to January break. Because they, I, I heard at least three parents bring it up, and I, right. I'm a little confused myself because on the one hand, planning is really, really helpful for everybody. If we know that we are doing it, or we know that we're not. On the other hand, nobody here knows what the, the pandemic situation is going to be like in two months. I think I can say that pretty confidently. Mm -hmm. Nobody knows. So is it, does it make more sense to make a decision early so people can plan, or, or does it make more sense to wait until we're closer to November? Well, we, we announced the end of October we would make that so um, decision on which way we would go. If we would go ahead and, and go remote during that time. Um, that was, as I expressed to the board at the time, kind of a struggle for me from the onset, but the uh, task force was very passionate if that was a consideration that it needed to be put on the calendar and in the plan so that parents could amply prepare. Um, and we would think, to me, the end of October, We've been at this a little bit longer um, and could make a better, we're still not going to know. Part of the complication, I believe, is flu season is going to hit at the same time. Sometimes the factors are not uh, disparate, right? The, the symptoms are not. Yeah. And so then it's going to, to raise everything to another level. Uh, the additional factor with the uh, task force really was a lot of people travel at the holidays. People are going out of state and um, traveling to high uh, risk areas. And um, sometimes people aren't um, really forthcoming when they travel <laughs> somewhere that's a high risk area. So we don't even realize they should be quarantined. In, in all fairness, that's been going on now. Oh, right. Okay. <laughs> exactly. There's yeah. there's dozens and dozens of families in Marysville that have gone to vacations to hot spots and not reported it and denied to the school that they did it. Yeah. Okay. So I don't know that that necessarily needs to be. So that so. So, so my inclination would be, I mean, in all transparency, if things are, let's, let's pretend that we stay in the model we're in now 
and we're seeing what we see now, I would think we'd continue. We would not go into a remote learning. That would be really a consideration if things were, uh, flu season is ramping way up. We may, if we come back five days a week, if we get all that information and feel comfortable, understand that we may be in remote learning pretty quickly anyways. If we have an outbreak in a building and several people quarantined and several staff quarantined, we wouldn't be able to have school. So we would move ourselves into remote. So that's a possibility anyways as we move forward. But I, I would say based on things right now, if you said Diane make a, a recommendation, right now we're doing a pretty good job i feel like given the teachers are working hard students are doing a great job following the guidelines and i that's why we are where we are uh even though if we are in fact leading the state this week i'm not sure um i, I believe that's more of a input issue um than anything um but uh you know right now i would say <clears throat> that doesn't look to be a serious consideration uh, during Thanksgiving to January. Quick question. So if you, uh, you know, if we came back five days a week and uh, would, are you, are you still thinking that um, <clears throat> one building could get shut down? Oh, sure. So, one building so still, one still, it, it will, it will be based on outbreaks and it's going to be based on where, yeah, where the what that information is. is. Yeah, right. that we have at that time okay um, we've worked hard to um, limit traveling teachers mm -hmm. so we've kind of eliminated that factor because that was one of the issues but that's made stacking shifts all on its own so there are there are a lot of pieces that we've done to help prevent a district um, shutdown but that right. also uh, we also recognize that we have families with multiple children at multiple grade levels. Right. So that all impacts in different ways. And when you say traveling teachers, you're talking about teachers traveling between the buildings. Yes, I'm sorry. Right. Yeah, yes, guess, just yes. for anybody watching or anybody who might have said Shared teachers might yeah. be the better way to say it. So a teacher that right. teaches at the high school and the middle school or multiple elementaries, we've eliminated all of those prior to the, to the beginning of school. So I know I know we've done at the building level. They're you know they're doing the surveys about the hybrid about the current setup and you know what are concerns, what are whatever things that need to be addressed. So then, um, what about timing of timing of any additional surveys for staff or parents? You know what are the do you have plans for those? Yeah. So. Um I talked to uh, the union, the teachers union, and they are doing a survey currently talking about um, current precautions, things that their hopes and fears uh, right. with, associated with different um, levels. Okay. Uh, Lynette and I will work on a uh, support staff <coughs> survey uh, to go out as well. Um, and then prior to the end of the grading period, we anticipated sending a survey out to parents uh, as we wrap up, you know, the, we're looking to close the nine weeks. Right. We want feedback on certain things as well. So how, as far as a timeline goes, so if, let's say the surveys go out and, and you've got a comfort level and we want to make a switch, how, how much time, because how much time to make that switch? Because you've got to be looking at transportation, at possibly additional barriers. I mean, what I would that. tell you is that I mean, <laughs> we've been working on those things already. So mm -hmm. we, we could make a shift um, relatively swiftly. We just need to give parents time to prepare. Right. But right. those things are constantly being looked at, our ridership. Mm -hmm. How could we condense? Um, we're still short three bus drivers, um, but that's worked to our advantage because our ridership is low. Mm -hmm. um, so all of those factors we've been working on already. So um, that I don't feel as nervous on the operation side. It would just right. be how quickly, um, and, and certainly we'd at least look to give parents a, a, at least a week's notice right. for a switch like that. We wouldn't say, we're going to tell you Monday. Right, right, right. Tell you Friday right. and we'll right. see you Monday. Right, right. Okay. So I, I think I have one more question. I, 
and again, this is listening to the concerns from the community, particularly the parents that are in there with their kids every day. Mm -hmm. And several of them made very passionate statements about the feeling that they have that their kids are getting behind. Mm -hmm. And that could be academically or it could be emotionally. Like some of the kids, some of the parents are saying their kids hate school now. And I'm not, I don't know what's going to happen this school year, but let's take a scenario that's probably pretty bleak, which is that we never get back to five days a week this school year, that we, you know, that's to me like a very uh, worst case scenario, right? Um, do you have a sense of, are our kids going to be behind academically? Are they going to be damaged emotionally? Is there a way that we can address that, or is it too soon to talk about repairing that? Right, I think we talked about that in the summer. Um, mm -hmm. We do believe kids are behind just from March through COVID. Mm -hmm. um, we're starting data meetings uh, in October I, that, with uh, principals to go over that. We, again, wanted to focus on relationships to start the school year. We felt like March went as well as it could because our teachers had all that time to build relationships with kids. It wasn't perfect, mm -hmm. but it, it went um as well it was going to because we had relationships and kids hadn't been here so we spent the first few weeks just really focusing on relationships and not doing achievement uh, data so we have now picked up on collecting uh, academic achievement data on students what's going to happen on the onset is and not to get too <laughs> educational ease is a student who might actually be a tier one student uh, is, is probably going to test and show us they're a two tier, tier two or tier three student until school's been in session a while, and then they'll come back to tier one. So uh, one of our reasons for starting the way we did is we did not want to elevate everyone to tier three when they in fact were just showing that because they haven't been in the practice of school and just had uh, retention issues, summer, summer slide. So we're now getting into where we're going to know <clears throat> specifically who is uh, showing uh, results that would look like a two-tier intervention, two, three, well, two a three intervention. So I can follow up with you on those specifics. I, I Social think, emotionally yeah. uh, was your second part, right? There's um, that whole thing too, right? Yeah. Yeah. So um, that's certainly a concern. Uh, Mark has worked on some strategies for teachers to uh, embed within their um, remote days as well as things they can do on the days students are there. Um, but but uh, we, I mean, we're not naive enough, that was one of those priorities to think that um, students couldn't be losing in that area as well. So we've uh, intentionally embedded pieces into um, remote days and into instructional time. Well, well, let me rephrase my question because I, I think, and I don't mean to put you on the spot because this is the kind of question that any one of us could either say, I can answer that or I can't. It's, it's a difficult question. But one of the perspectives that's out there is they're getting so far behind emotionally or educationally that it's worth the health, health risk to just throw them all back in. Mm -hmm. So my question is, is that true? Is it true that what they're losing by being hybrid or remote, they can't get back? That we can't get it back? No, I don't think it's true that they can't get it back. It's going to take time to get it back. I would agree with that statement. I mean, a tier one student is, uh, is, a, is going to have skill regression over the summer. That's something we know educationally a tier one student's gonna regress as well, right? And so uh, once school gets, uh, picks back up, the reg regression is minimized once they're back in the habit of school and start retention pieces again. I mean, that's, that's how the summer slide works. There's always that regression. So what we've done, in fact, is extend that regression time through COVID, right? And so the, the obstacle for us or the challenge for us is really, okay, how can we make those remote lessons impactful, make sure reading is targeted at the right grade level, um, that we're running groups when we have FaceTime with kids to maximize that. It's never going to, two days a week is never going to be the same as five, never. 
I mean, that, that would be the, <clears throat> there will be slides in, in learning. So it, it is, oh, but it sounds like they, they are not permanent. What's that? Those slides are not permanent. No. So, I mean, I don't know. We've never been through this before. <laughs> right, right. I mean, that'd be pre precursor everything. Yeah. But with the right instructional strategies, which we have embedded, right. we will be able to make gains. But it's going to take time to get those gains back. But it's not a permanent um, position to be in. But we need to to be wise about the time we have now, be wise about the instructional practices we're using on remote learning days to help impact what happens on the days during class. So I, I saw Tracy Richardson this morning at a business impact breakfast and she talked about trying to um, get a bill out there to provide more funding for our community. And, um, you know, I, I look at this as, as a, I mean, it's a great opportunity for our community to pull together, and so I'm just kind of wondering what kind of resources are out there to help families, and I know we've talked about, you know, maybe some high school students might be available to help with tutoring or go into a house for a couple of hours so that the parents have a break and can get their work done, things like that. Um, and, and I, again, that's kind of, I know that's, you don't have anything really Officially set up at this time, and it's also challenging to offer resources. And, and mm -hmm. like, we can't vet everybody ourselves. But are there conversations going on with maybe other providers? I, I know Dan had talked about the Hope Center. Yep, the the Hope Center has reached out, um, yeah. and Nan started that conversation with me. Mm -hmm. um, and they're going to be offering some tutoring services. So right now, they're trying to hire tutors. Okay. So we've, uh, Mark is leading that charge from our end. Okay. Um, and I believe the time was like nine to six, something like that. And what, like financially, because, you know, we're hearing that too, people that are used to sending their kids to school and not having to worry about the financial impact of daycare, mm -hmm. you know, what is, is that? I'm not sure to? the intent is to replace daycare in that no. tutoring session. It, session. Right. It, my understanding is to work on homework and those right. kind of things. Right. but. I think that service is free uh, yes. for certain students of the community. Actually, um, it's as long as there is a student that matches the money requirements, everyone else can attend, no problem. There just has to be one person in okay. there that matches the income requirements, then everyone else rides on the coattails. Okay. Yeah. So, good, good to know. But I know that they're still working on like what would be the best timing, like a morning session versus a afternoon versus an evening session. Um, so yeah. challenges with using teachers, obviously, right. they would not be available until after three or whatever their work day. So, right. Um, and then we're working with mental health and recovery. Mm -hmm. um, we've hired an additional school navigator to help with mental health and support for families and services for families. Um, so we have a, a partnership with the Mental Health and Recovery Board um, in, in upping those services as well. Okay. So I could I say one thing? Sure. I, mean, I want to make it very clear that uh, everybody I haven't talked to one person that doesn't want kids to come back five days. Exactly. And it, this would be really easy if you asked me a question about increasing a reading level of a kid from one spot to the other and the yes. strategies that are associated with that. There's tons of research. Mm -hmm. There's not research that provides a playbook for a superintendent or a board of education on exactly how to handle a pandemic crisis. and make sure that students are safe and community is safe and um, it weighs heavy on all of our hearts um, all of this so I just I think it's really important that people understand that there's not a day or a night that goes by that we're not trying to figure out yeah. a way to do things better right. well I know that many of the people said we want to know the metrics all right right and 
I, I brought up, you know, we've we've been doing this for a short period of time. Right. Uh, and I think it, hopefully it's clear that the governor's map, the different levels and the switches from one week to another is not something that's going to, in and of itself, drive a decision as to whether we can go back to five days of instruction or not. My dad, I want every kid to be in class as much as possible. But my dad told me more times than I want to know that I was old enough for my wants not to hurt me. And uh, this is one of those times when I have to, to think about that. You know, what I want is something that I can't necessarily have at this point. And in terms of metrics, I think there are some places that as a board, as a board member, I'm going to be looking at the recommendations of the Union County Health Department. You know, what they say in terms of social distancing and wearing masks, uh, the statewide data, local data, all that kind of stuff on those kinds of things. Our COVID numbers, now we have 20 days of experience with COVID numbers. Mm -hmm. And so to try to come up and say, if 5% test positive, or if we have 10% quarantined, or if we're under this, you know, 6% affected by COVID, we're gonna go, I, I'm not comfortable doing that. Because, you know, we don't know what sort of impact uh, we're getting a feel. Uh, we've had, what was it, 22, 22 positive tests and we've got 49 people in quarantine. So we're getting kind of a feel now mm -hmm. in the last couple of weeks as to how COVID might impact our ability to have teachers in the classroom and also be able to get kids in the classroom. Uh, the space in the building. You know, we have a finite amount of space. And so, you know, that's a metric. Uh, as long as we have social distancing, that's going to be key. And parents have said in their letters, and rightfully so, I'm concerned about my child. And nobody ought to be more concerned about their child than them. And please, if you're a parent, you got a kid in our school district, speak up and speak out. Let us know what we're doing right and what we're doing wrong. We're working our butts off to try to do things in the right way and keep your kids safe and get them well educated. But we've got to try to do both things. And, uh, but, having said that, this is not a decision that's just about the kids, but it's also about all the teachers, the bus drivers, the administrators, and everybody else that's involved. We have to make a decision because uh, they want a safe work environment. They want to be able to go home to their families. And, and uh, we have to, as a, as a board, I think we have to consider uh, what sort of situation we're putting people into. Um, and so in terms of specific numbers, uh, I, I can't think of a single number that I could say this is something, if we reach this point, that would drive me toward five days a week. But I think uh, as we look at these general areas and as we gain some experience, looking you know, a month from now, the middle of October, end of October, I think we will be in a much better position to make a judgment as to uh, what, if any changes, we're going to be able to make. Well, there is one number. Zero. Zero. Right. When I get to zero. <laughs> but I, I just want to echo what Diane said and what uh, Dick said. I want the kids back five days a week. That's not an issue. Nobody should misunderstand or mishear it. And you're saying every single person you talk to wants the kids back five days a week. Okay. So this is not driven by anything other than what Dick was just explaining. Well, it's nice. People want the kids back five days a week, whether they're right. teachers, administrators, board members, parents, whoever. Right. 
I, that's, I was just thinking about that one TED talk that you had sent to the board, you know, finding common ground. I said, really, that's, that's our common ground. We, we all want the kids back all the time, but then we start differing when how and when we can do that, and how, you know, how do we go about that, what's our comfort level getting there. So that's our challenge, right? And, and our challenge is to continually try to communicate where we are and, and that time frame. So again, kind of looking at that trimester, semester time frame and always trying to have information you know, a couple weeks or a week or so before the end and try to keep our community updated and for them to reach out to us. Mm -hmm. Do you have anything else you wanted to share? Uh, no, I would just say, um, you know, as we come together and have these groups, what's always been great about Marysville is everyone's always had an open heart and open mind mm -hmm. and a sense of collaboration. And I just hope that, you know, I, I know that that will be the way we move forward too. Right. Um, that that's how we have operated at high levels and, and that's what we need to continue to do. Um, I will commit as long as Marcus can be on board that we'll try to get a video out weekly. Okay. We, we've already done one this week, so let me make that commitment. Right. But we'll try to get a video out weekly. Uh, they seem to get great results and high reviews. It seems that emails are getting lost, so okay. we'll, we'll try, uh, we'll do both. Obviously, it comes in the email um, with those uh, and it might not it might not have the details people want but it can be a, a touch point for people to to watch um so look for that uh coming out from here on out great i think and just kind of some of your comments made me think again about um you know just that reality that that we know there are a lot of really strong emotions out there um, but i, I want to remind our parents and our guardians that you know we are all role models for our students, and um, there are respectful ways to share thoughts. I, you know, I felt felt like all of these letters to the board were very respectful, um, and and we really work hard to promote that respect and caring amongst our staff and students. So I just encourage everyone to be good role models, and um, you know, kind of stick to I don't agree with this, and try and stay away from name calling, things like that. So. It's like, you know, we are, that doesn't really do anything good for our community. And, and we really are all trying to do the best things and working as hard as we can. So I think if anybody didn't have any more comments about this, I know Nan wanted to give us a quick update on the community coffee. Um, so we're going to um, relaunch the community coffee in an outdoor session. So we're going to do it at the Creekview parking lot. Um, many of the addresses of the people that wrote letters are from the Mill Valley community. Right. So it's a nice centrally located, uh, and it's kind of going to be rain or shine. So October 10th, 9 a.m. to 10 a.m. Um, and I'd like to encourage uh, parents, um, we don't usually do this, but if you are planning on attending or you feel that there's going to be a large group of people maybe someone could email us from the community and let us know that it's going to be a large group of people typically we only have uh, two board members together but um, if it's going to be a large group then maybe we could have more but be in separate in separate small groups because yeah if we have more than two board members we're, we're not allowed uh -huh. to meet with more than two board members or that's considered a public meeting so I think uh, we had talked about if, if we needed to maybe go have one at Mill Valley or have one at Northwood, you know, that would give us a couple different locations. And I, uh, do we, uh, what board members are available mm -hmm. on October 10th? I can do October 10th. Okay. I, I'm available that day. Would you like me to set up a form so that they can get to it easily on the website as opposed to emailing you? Oh, that would be very good, like a sign up form? Mm -hmm. Yeah. And we'll just put it on the front page yeah, of the website. Yeah. Yeah. And it, you know, just like your intent, your yeah. intent to show up, and it doesn't. You don't have to sign right. up to show up. No, no. Now, what right. are you guys going to do weather-wise? Did you say rain or shine? I mean, we'll be in cars, and you know, oh. if the weather's horrible, 
you know, we may say, hey guys, this is, you know, it's thundering and lightning. Yeah. Okay. We're not going to, you know, force people to try and yell or, you know. Well, if you would want to cancel too, mm -hmm. because it would be something like that, we could right. get that on the website for right. quickly. Send out tweets, whatever. Right. You just need to let us know. Right. Um, October, even November. Um, yeah. I think weather-wise, we should be fine uh, with the jacket. December right. might be a little bit. January, we're going to have to come up with. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I think it's you know in December we haven't done it in the past just because people. We found that really wasn't the time that they were focusing on community coffees. Mm -hmm. Correct. Mm -hmm. okay. I can I can be a backup if you need. Okay. okay. Yeah, I'm available too. Yeah. Okay, good, good. Yeah. So um, again, um, seems like a lot of the concerns are coming from not everyone gave their um, child grade, but it seems like a lot of elementary mm -hmm. um, parents. Um, from the Mill Valley area in particular. So mm -hmm. um, this is a good chance for us to hear you know, directly from, right. from them and um, bring their thoughts and we can listen. Great. And we'll post that on the website as well. We'll update okay. that information. Thank you. Yes. And we'll, yeah, we'll be anxious to hear how you're, um, you know, about that meeting with the advisory committee too. So yep. we'll, we'll look forward to that. Uh, and the only, only other thing I wanted to remind people of, and for anybody watching too, is the reverse homecoming parade that's scheduled for September 30th. So let's see, that's next Wednesday from mm -hmm. 6 to 6.30. Yeah, is, there, is there any information on the district website about that? I don't remember seeing an article yet. Yeah, sure. okay. So maybe, I'm sure something can go on the Facebook page yeah. or something, and, and the district website, just to remind. Mm -hmm people about that. There was only one other thing uh, that I wanted to update. Sure. Uh, you all received oh, an yeah. email about an investigation that involved some of our students uh, with the um, stealing of political signs. Right. Um, that situation is under investigation currently um, and certainly it is a, a legal issue as well. So um, the high school administration is looking into that and uh, dealing with that according to our code of conduct and athletic code of conduct. Um, so I wanted to make sure I just kept you up to date. Okay. Yeah, it's know. being investigated by the police, actually. Well, it's being investigated by the police, but okay. we also have a responsibility through the athletic right. code of conduct as well to, to do an investigation. Right. Okay. Thank you. If there are no other comments, I would accept the motion to adjourn. So moved. Motion by Mr. Smith. Second. Second by Ms. Savage. Roll call. Mr. Smith. Yes. Ms. Savage. Yes. Mr. Luke. Yes. Ms. Powers. Yes. Mr. Mine. Yes. Motion carries. And uh, before I officially say we're adjourned, I, I also just wanted to thank everybody um, for some really thoughtful input, great conversation, and uh, keep up the good work to our staff, administration. Mm -hmm. We just can't thank you enough. And our families too, mm -hmm. and the students. So, with that, uh, we are adjourned at 554. <laughs>